evening. Welcome to an evening of poetry, a special event in celebration of World Poetry Day and the Fulbright Program's 75th anniversary. My name is Kara Kennecke. I am a project manager on the Fulbright events team at the Institute of International Education, and I'm so delighted to see so many of you here this evening. I wanted to begin with a reminder that this event is being recorded, so please disable your webcam at this time if you are not comfortable with your image being recorded, although we love to see everybody's um, faces tonight. Closed captioning is also available, and you can enable that directly on your Zoom screen. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the US Department of State representatives, sponsors of the Fulbright program, who are here in attendance this evening. My colleagues and I work closely with them to plan activities such as tonight's event. Over the next hour and a half, we'll hear readings of original works by accomplished poets and Fulbright alumni, including a poetry showcase from audience members who have joined from around the country. We'll also have time available for Q&A, so feel free to type your questions into the Zoom chat box, and we may invite some of you to ask your question aloud. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's host, Aliyah Pierce. Aliyah is a 2019 Fulbright National Geographic Fellow and Explorer to Trinidad and Tobago, an educator and international performance poet. She has performed her spoken word poetry internationally from the UK to South Africa and at numerous TEDx events. Her work has been published online and in print, including The Guardian, New York Daily News, Caribbean Writer, and Autism Speaks. Aliyah, thank you so much for being here this evening and over to you. Thank you, Kara, for that lovely introduction. And hello, friends. Good morning, good day, and good evening to wherever you may be in this world. <laughs> My name is Aliyah Pierce, and as mentioned, I'm an alumna of the Fulbright and National Geographic program. I am unbelievably excited to be here with you all today, hosting our evening of poetry in honor of World Poetry Day and the Fulbright Program's 75th anniversary. I want to thank this evening's sponsor and the sponsor of the Fulbright Program, the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. To provide a little background on the Fulbright Program, the Fulbright is the flagship international academic exchange program sponsored by the US government. It has carried out its goal of fostering mutual understanding between the people of the United States and people of other countries since 19, 1946, excuse me. Funding for the program is provided by the US Congress through an annual appropriation by partner governments, by the private sector, including individual donors and institutions of higher education. Several U.S. nonprofit organizations administer components of the program on behalf of the State Department, including the Institute of International Education, and we thank IIE for organizing this event this evening. In celebration of the Fulbright Program's 75th anniversary, yes, I'm going to say it again, 75 years in 2021, and representing 75 years of positive impact on the lives of individuals as well as on communities, both global and local, we are celebrating the diversity and inclusion within the program and its responsibility to amplify diverse stories to underscore the fact that Fulbrighters come from all backgrounds, which is a reflection of the diversity of the United States. Throughout this year, the US Department of State and its many Fulbright partners will highlight the impressive accomplishments and legacy of the program and it's over 400,000 alumni both in the United States and in over 160 countries across the globe to inspire the next generation of Fulbright participants. We invite you to learn more about our celebrations and to join us for other events like this evening by visiting Fulbright's 75th Anniversary's Digital Hub at www.fulbright75.org, which will be shared in the chat. We, the Fulbright family, are so happy that you are joining us safely and within your own homes for tonight's evening of poetry. Your presence here is truly felt and appreciated. One year ago, 
you know, we were faced with a global pandemic that we thought would be the toughest moment we'd face. Since then, we've come to realize that even our problematic and troubling history is not so much in the past, but a present reality. And on top of that, this year we have said too many goodbyes too soon. Yet we kept going, we keep going, we press on, we persevered with pride and purpose, and today we still stand. We still have our voices, and we still have our pens and pencils, and those three things create massive change. For this evening, we have an amazing lineup of three Fulbright alums and panelists who are creating change through language and creative writing. From Pulitzer Prize winners and authors to community activists and spoken word artists, tonight is going to be dynamic. So here's a little bit about our Fulbright alums and panelists and their work. Elisa Gonzalez is a poet, essayist, fiction writer, and 2020 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award recipient. She was a Fulbright US student to Poland from 2016 to 2018. Her work appears in the New Yorker, Adi Magazine, Mississippi Review, The Literary Review, The Boiler Journal, and elsewhere. We also have Ruth Bihar joining us. She is an anthropologist, professor, poet, writer, MacArthur Genius Fellow, and John Simon Guggenheim Fellow. She was a Fulbright US student to Spain and later a Fulbright US scholar to Argentina. She is the author of the Pura Belpre award-winning book, Lucky Broken Girl. Her new novel, Letters from Cuba, is soon to appear in Spanish as Cartas de Cuba. And last but never least, the Will Langford. He is a poet, teaching artist, and 2017 Motown Mike Spoken Word Artist of the Year who divides his energy between education and community development projects in the U.S. and East Africa. He was a Fulbright U.S. English teaching assistant to Kenya in 2014. His work has appeared in the Detroit Neighborhood Guidebook, Illinois Review, Work 6, Falling Hard, and Two Bridges Review. Are they outstanding or what? <laughs> Put it in the chat how amazing they are. <laughs> and they will be speaking with us tonight in various capacities. So now Fulbright family and friends, we will open with our featured speaker for the evening, Rita Dove. Rita Dove is a poet and writer, a former US Poet Laureate, Pulitzer Prize winner, and 1974 Fulbright US student to Germany. Her poetry has earned her fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Guggenheim Foundation, the National Humanities Center, among others. She holds the Chair of Commonwealth, Professor of English at the University of Virginia, where she has been teaching since 1989. Tonight, we are playing ex excerpts from a special session Rita Dub has graciously recorded for us this evening. The full video will be posted for your viewing on World Poetry Day on the Fulbright 75th anniversary website. And just so you know, World Poetry Day is Sunday the 21st. So we're celebrating a little bit earlier, but you know, you can't, you can't have enough poetry. <laughs> Please remember though, there is no snapping feature because poets, we love our snaps. Um, there is no snapping feature in Zoom. We encourage you to use the clapping feature <laughs> available on the reactions menu on your Zoom toolbar. Tonight is an evening of connection and engagement. So let's talk, let's empower one another and let's honor what literature has done for each and every one of us. So without further ado, let's welcome Rita Dove to the stage to share her first piece and reflection with us. I thought what I would do is read a, a little group of poems taken from this book Sonata Mulatica, it is called. And the reason why is because I think without having been on a Fulbright uh, when I was very young, I don't think this book would ever have been written. Now the book was written very recently, just published in 2009, I think around there. But, um, but the experiences that uh, I had when I was a young Fulbright scholar to to, to um, Germany, to Tübingen, Germany, 
uh, really informed the entire uh, piece. I think the idea of being different, the idea of, of this other language made me experience uh, that, that quality of being a foreigner in, uh, in another land and reading yet all of these masterpieces that I had loved so much in my, uh, my undergraduate career uh, made a vital impression on me. But first of all, the story of this book. It is called Sonata Mulatica. That's a very odd title. It's taken actually from a term of endearment that Beethoven used for a young mixed race prodigy uh, violinist who he had met in Vienna. Uh, this violinist's name was George Bridgetower. And he had come to Vienna to play for the maestro. Now Beethoven heard him dropped everything and began to compose a sonata for him. And that is the story that is told, the story of the violinist's life in this book. Let me read for you the very first poem in the book, which tells you actually the entire story. And then we'll get back to the, the stuff that goes behind the story. It's called The Bridge Tower, with a dedication from Ludwig van Beethoven in 1803 written in Italian, per il mulato Bridgetower, gran pazzo e compositore mulatico, which loosely translated, my Italian is not very good, but which loosely translated means for the mulato Bridgetower, grand pal and composer and mulatic, mulatico composer, or mulato composer. The Bridgetower. If was at the beginning, if he had been older, if he hadn't been dark, brown eyes ablaze in that remarkable face, if he had not been so gifted, so young a genius with no time to grow up, if he hadn't grown up undistinguished to an obscure old age, if the piece had actually been, as Kreutzer exclaimed, unplayable, even after our man had played it and for years no one else was able to follow, so that the composer's fury would have raged for naught, and wagging tongues could keep alive the original dedication from the title page he shredded. Oh, if only Ludwig had been better looking or cleaner or a real aristocrat, fun instead of the unexceptional fun from some Dutch farmer. If his ears had not already begun to squeal and whistle, if he hadn't drunk his wine from lead cups, if he could have found true love. Then the story would have held. In 1803, George Paul Green Bridgetower, son of Friedrich Augustus the African Prince and Maria Anna Sovinki of Biala in Poland, traveled from London to Vienna, where he met the great master, who would stop work on his third symphony to write a sonata for his new friend to premiere triumphantly on May 24th, whereupon the composer himself leapt up from the piano to embrace his lunatic mulatto. Who knows what would have followed? They might have palled around some, just a couple of wild and crazy guys strutting the town like rock stars, hitting the bars for a few beers, a few laughs, instead of falling out over a girl nobody remembers, nobody knows. Then this bright-skinned papa's boy could have sailed his 15-minute fame straight into the record books, where, instead of a Regina Carter or Aaron Dworkin or Boyd Tinsley sprinkled here and there, we would find rafts of black kids scratching out scales on their matchbox violins so that some day they might play the impossible. Beethoven's Sonata Number no. 9 in A Major, Opus 47, also known as the Bridge Tower. So that is the story. Bridge Tower drops out of history because he got in an argument with the great Ludwig van Beethoven. And what is so intriguing about this story and what, having been to Germany and knowing German, helped me research in a way, was that uh, you thought, well, what, what was the fury about? 
bridge tower says they had he said something about a girl and i in looking at this fascinated by how that could have raged enraged the composer so much i discovered you know some of uh, beethoven's notes his diaries and in them there is in very very colloquial german some little comments to bridge tower after they had met saying oh let's go get a beer and it's the quality of that language the fact that it's not high german but it's really just very very casual german shows me that they were friends for a brief and intense period of time during the writing and the playing of this sonata which we know as the kreutzer so my research really began as as curiosity i was a poet uh, when I went to Germany, I, it, as a Fulbright scholar, I knew that I wanted to be a poet, but I didn't know what the world was going to do with me as a poet and whether they'd want me as a poet. And to leap All right, I love this piece because it is this beautiful relationship between history, music, and poetry. Um, my mentor, she always says that each line is delicious. <laughs> I was like, that's an interesting word choice. <laughs> but really, Rita Dove's work is delicious, it's rich. Um, and I would like to ask our panelists um, some thoughts. So Ruth, if I can start with you, do you have any initial thoughts, reflections, any themes that specifically stand out in her poem for you? Well, I'm so glad we got got to hear this poem or parts of it. It's it's really stunning and so important. And I didn't know about Bridge Tower, which I think says something about history <laughs> and, and the fact that, you know, who gets to write our history, who gets erased from our history, musical history, and in this case, also European history and Black, Black history or Black European history. Um, so I think it's so interesting that Rita Dove, as a poet, takes it upon herself to reinsert Bridge Tower into history because he had been erased from history because of this argument with Beethoven, right? So I, so it's just um, so fascinating to me that, that she's doing that, that she's acting against erasure, that as a poet, she's working to, um, to, to bring Bridge Tower back in, into history because he existed and he was an important figure and had had his name and music and presence been written into history that would have led to something else how did how did she describe it there were uh, black kids might be playing the impossible so so i think it was just so like such an kind of advocacy role that she played as as a poet um, in this work thank you for that um you, you bring up that quote and I actually wrote it down because it was such a striking line. Yeah. Um, Rita says, who knows what would have followed, we would find raps of black kids scratching out scales on, on their matchbox violins so that someday they might play the impossible. Um, Will, uh, what impact do you think representation makes um, in, in the writing world in general, <laughs> in the world? <laughs> One of my favorite, um elements of Dove's poem is the if and the instead. Uh, and, and it calls to mind how important it is that not only that we tell stories, but that we have representation in the stories that we're telling. Um, there's this idea um, that, that we need to re-story and you see it bear out in, in things like uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s Finding Your Roots, uh, the New York Times 1619 Project. This idea that there's a huge and untold story, especially if we're talking about uh, folks who have been marginalized. And so for me, poetry, art, and specifically the act of like teaching writing, uh, gives me the opportunity to teach people to story and to tell stories that might not otherwise get told. Um, and, 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 and that, um, you know, drives a lot of my writing and my work. Thank you for that. Um, and, and you brought up a thought in my, my mind about this representation and what does it mean to you? And so I wanna jump to uh, Elisa, you know, do you feel represented in the arts? Um, and are you working 
or are you working to solve this because you do not feel represented? And if you would like to kind of discuss a little bit of what representation means to you, because I think the definition is important as well. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, that is, <laughs> this is an enormous question. Um, I mean, I think um, to try to connect, the, you know, the kind of larger question of representation to this poem, because I think you can, one of the things that I think is most interesting, um, or sometimes when I feel most represented, it's not necessarily because someone has placed my type, you know, like external characteristics on the page that can still feel very fake or very far. I mean, we see this failure in representation like all the time and various attempts, but the but what Rita Dove is doing so marvelously here, I think, and exercising a tremendous power through that um, continued conditional is a representation of an imagination on the page. And I think where, when I feel myself most represented and what I would like to try to represent is, you know, both my individual consciousness, but also like a variety of consciousnesses in poetry or in fiction. Um, so I think there's like that power of the kind of imaginative work and the thinking that goes on on the page that's like, um, that is a crucial part of any kind of representation or, um, you know, effort to create, a, you know, a literary or artistic canon that actually includes everyone. Um, oh, thank you. Um, now that we're talking about the actual writing, <laughs> the getting it on the page, <laughs> could you have any advice for our writers in the room of, you know, starting with this, you know, knowledge of history, for example, in the Fulbright, you're doing all this research and then you have to almost just dissect it to be able to figure out what you're trying to say on the page. So as a writer, um, how do you portray this in your writing? Um, if, if anybody would like to chime in. <laughs> Ruth, I see you smiling. Elisa, is, oh, you took your mute off. I like it. <laughs> Uh, I'll jump in. I, I mean, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I'm I'm both a writer and an, a cultural anthropologist. So the two things come together and mesh for me in, in good ways. And um, as an anthropologist, I had to learn to listen very well and to pay attention, not to be the one speaking, but to be the one listening and and really, you know, being precise about what I was hearing, writing down what I was hearing. So I think that could be a good start for any writer, um, whether you're listening to, I'm thinking of a young writer who might be listening to stories of elders or stories of friends, or just to, to be there to listen to other people. I think that's really important and to de really develop your lesson, your listening skills and really being present and paying attention. I think that's a good start for any kind of writing. I agree with you completely about listening. Um, and there's a kind of, which I think also points to sort of a more generalized need for attention, um, like to people um, and the world around you. That seems a prerequisite to me for any kind of creativity. Um, and I also, Aaliyah, you referred to research and um, Rita Dove's poem is obviously very based in research. Um, but I think for me from, uh, so I you know, was doing a research fellowship in Poland and I was a poet. Um, but I was not um, just writing down things that I was researching. I think I was I was looking for like apertures, like kind of gaps where I could fill something in or imagine a new slant on something. And I think that um, that feeling, which it seems I, I'm you know I'm projecting, but it does seem like Rita Dove found that with this poem, um, you know, a way to like. Um, not just recite, but to reimagine or reconfigure. And I think that feeling is really, really exciting if you're drawing on any anyone else's story or on archival research or interviews or, or anything. No, well, for sure. Will, if you'd like to add any closing thoughts on this? Yeah, I would add that um, I think it's important that we see our place in history. 
that we see ourselves in this very moment as having the ability to like inscribe our existence upon the world that we're in. When we begin to, to write about history, it's, it's immensity, you know, just yawns and stretches in front of us because where do you begin? Whose history, whose story, his story, her story, our story, all of this is so much. And so I think that when we're thinking about research, a great place to begin is your hometown, uh, your family, uh, a business in your community. It's, it's such a deep well uh, for beginning research. And I think that makes it a lot more um, consumable and manageable um, as we think about how to incorporate research into our own work. Uh, we can start at home. We can start at home reimagining um, something new. All these great lines. I need I need people to quote this in the chat, please, so we can remember this stuff for later. Um, but I love I love the conversation that's happening. But I know time for a stickler, and we have to keep moving. Um, but thank you all for these amazing amazing comments. Um, so let's move on to Rita's second piece and and her reflection. And to leap many, many years. And this is a poem where Bridge Tower, who is now in his 20s, the same age I was when I was just going off to a Fulbright, and he goes to Germany. Uh, I'm not going to tell you his entire story except to say that he was in England for quite a f during his formative years, uh, playing at the court, and that he wanted to come back into the European continent, which he had left as a child, in order to visit his mother, but also in order to seek out this great man, Beethoven. So when he comes back, he ends up joining up with his brother, who lived in Germany, still with the mother, and they begin to play some concerts. His brother played cello. Now, as happenstance would have it, I also played the cello. I played the cello and the, and the viola da gamba. Uh, music is one of my passions, and so this story, in a certain way, was waiting for me to write it. I felt, but he he joins up with his brother, and he go and in Dresden, they begin to play a few concerts before he goes on, builds up his nerve, and and to meet Beethoven. This poem is called "Floating Requiem," and in a way, it's a it's a love poem to Dresden. It it is a poem about uh, the bleakness of German winters and uh, that, that quality of the continent that I had never experienced anything like until I had gone there as a student. Floating Requiem, Dresden, 1802 to 1803. Summer ended powerfully, as if God had snapped a branch from his mightiest oak and thundered enough. The sky dimmed. Cloaks appeared. The Elbe's blue road turned wild and gray, struck by a grim fury. Everywhere one trudged, stone claimed dominion and set an implacable face to the centuries, only to culminate in this pleasing line of turrets and domes along the rapping, darkening riverfront. Wind fingered the crevices, timbered walls stiffened as chill seeped up through our boots. Cathedrals thrilled to their tasks, spires bristling at twilight, and the doors cranked wide to spew out their gold. High in the organ loft we waited, my brother and I, skins burnished by candlelight, instruments gleaming. Watch them enter, the weary, the obedient, the curious, a ghostly scent of malted barley rising from their thick woolens and flaxen hair. They came for comfort, dragging the cold in behind them. They came for light, then closed their eyes, the better to listen. Cello plowing low while I skimmed the thin ice above, teased the bright edges. All winter we played, and they lingered, through incense and gingerbread, from Advent to Christkindle, to New Year's, to Drei Könige, a salute to Balthasar, the Dark King. 
and when the listening was finished, they stood up to gather their bundles, the last candle guttered, and we stepped out to a world rinsed of cares. A pale lemon light shone over the river. On the far shore I could see a faint radiance, a white path, snowbells budding, shouldering up through the muck for their first raw gulp of pure ether. And I knew it was time to take destiny further south. I'm going to say it, delicious again. <laughs> um, I, I truly enjoy this piece because it highlights those aspects of new experiences, being an outsider. And I'm, and I'm sure she has experienced pieces of that before, but to do it in a new country, <laughs> to do it for the very first time somewhere else, it's such uh, a, a rich and complex experience. And she beautifully lays it on the page for us. Um, and so I'd like to start with Elisa, more broadly in general, um, how does it feel to experience something for the very first time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I also felt very, or I recognized that experience that she was describing. That it's amazing. I mean, and the, but I think the details of that speak to um, something that I think is kind of always true, or at least for me was very true of the, the Fulbright experience, um, is that receptive mode with which you can approach a completely, something that feels completely new or is in fact completely new to you geographically or in some other way experientially. There's a, I kind of, I feel it as being like newly opened to the world, almost kind of, I mean, this is a gross image, but sort of played. I mean, like everything can touch me, you know, like there is nothing to which I am in your, there is nothing that is, there is nothing that is boring. Um, and uh, for, and I, I feel like she kind of is really capturing that in those textures and, um, and the intensity of the images there. Um, and I guess I do kind of locate that feeling of newness in travel or in specifically in like kind of having gone to live somewhere else as opposed to just visiting it. Although there is a, there are varieties of newness. Um, but yeah, I think that kind of ultimate like openness where you're unprotected is, um, it can be quite frightening, but is like where you can perceive, I think the most interesting and beautiful, beautiful things. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I love that idea of being completely newly open and being almost in a receptive mode. Um, Cause I felt that as well when I, when I went on my journey abroad, um, even though I, my family's from Trinidad and Tobago and I've been there, it's such a different experience to live somewhere, but it's, but like you said, there are different levels. And I, I love that, that explanation. That was beautiful. Um, Will, I'm, I'm curious about you. Did your Fulbright experience evoke any of those similar feelings that Elisa is talking about? Yeah, yeah, quite a, quite a few. There are a lot of uh, brand new moments. Um, I traveled each day um, across uh, Mount Elgin, one of Kenya's tallest mountains, uh, to reach the school where I taught. Um, during the rainy season, if I didn't arrive back at home before the rain set in at around four o'clock in the day, um, I'd be stuck on the road. Every day, no matter what, I always made it back home until one day I dwaddled a bit after school. It rained so hard that day as I was riding my motorcycle down this rocky cliff uh, that I knew that my best bet was to stop and stay where I was. That was too much rain too. And so I found a metal structure that was just barely finished, a tin corrugated roof on top of some sticks. Uh, and when I got near it, I saw that there were school children and, and, and farmers and just all sorts of people also huddled underneath this corrugated steel lean-to to stay out of the rain. We huddled there for about an hour in complete silence because this rain is so loud that you couldn't even hear someone say hello. So people just smiled you know, with their eyes or with their faces. 
And I think in the face of some place so new and so different from home, eventually you arrive at a moment where emotionality, where, where our closeness to people erodes whatever is happening because I felt safe under there. And I was having an experience that like nothing in the world could pay for or arrange. Yeah. That's a poem in, in and of itself. <laughs> and I think that takes us right back to this, this listening and being present in the moment and just being receptive to what is around you um, and just being in that and folks, Will, you, you got a fan club right now. <laughs> People, uh, Sandra, I was transported there with you. Beautiful memory. Um, um, that's beautiful how tenderly you remember that rain. Um, and so I think you, your description of that is so vivid. And that takes me to think of, you know, how do we portray that in our writing? You know, this is always coming back to writing. And I think you answered it. It's, it's this reflection, um, this, this paying attention in the moment and just remembering and being honest to the feelings that are happening within you. And I'm not sure if anybody else has any thoughts to share, but you know, how do we bring that into our writing? If Ruth, if you'd like to chime in. <laughs> I can try. I, I mean, I love the <laughs> fact that, um, I mean, both, both Elisa and Will said such amazing things. Um, you know, the, the floating requiem. I mean, it's it's so amazing to write a love poem to a place. And so I was thinking about how we fall in love with places. Of course, we fall in love with people, but we also fall in love with places. And, and I love that. And I think that has been very true of my life as an anthropologist. And my Fulbright gave me, the first Fulbright gave me that opportunity to fall in love with a place. And um, I didn't have that experience of rain, but I had some other similar experiences in this little village in northern Spain where I lived. And I had grown up, you know, I'm from Cuba, but I grew up in New York. So I was very used to urban life. And suddenly I was in this small village in the north of Spain where people lived with their cows and their sheep and their goats and their chickens. All of that was inside of their house. And I had never experienced anything like that um, and they were just so incredibly kind to me I think it's one of the things that I really want to call attention to is this kindness of strangers I think Will you were talking about the same thing that you know you're out there in the world you know you you put yourself in the position of being a foreigner or outsider and people just take you in you know and um, and I was very young when I was doing that work and I um, explained to the host family that I was living with that I was going to need a desk to be able to write notes, field notes about my life there. Um, and the concept of a desk was a very unusual thing um, for them. And I explained you know, why I needed it and what it was. And back at that time, we didn't have laptops and computers. So it was actually you know, a typewriter <laughs> that I had carried to Spain, a very heavy typewriter. And, and, um, and Balbino, um, the, the father of the family where I was living, made a desk for me just out of scraps of wood, just put it together so that I could do my writing. So it's kind of a long answer to your question, but I needed to be able to write and I couldn't hold um, a manual typewriter on my lap. It's not like a laptop. You have to have it on a, on a surface because it's, you're you know, putting a lot of energy into typewriter keys so I needed the right kind of desk and he made me the desk so that I could write um, which was so amazing so um, so I think there's generosity and vulnerability in writing you have to kind of access those emotions of vulnerability and surrender that Elisa was talking about I think to write about these experiences so you make yourself vulnerable and you also recognize that you know you're gazing at them but they're also gazing at you and it's a very reciprocal process and I think when I was writing I tried to put all of that on the page that it wasn't just me observing them but they were also observing me and out of that combination of gazes something would emerge. Yeah it's this relationship that's happening um, and I mean beautiful words each and every one of you and, and I love this idea of falling in love with places and in order to do that falling in love in general, you have to be vulnerable, you have to surrender. And I think that's what writers, poets, artists do every single day is they surrender themselves to the world to be able to create and give back to the world. Um, so thank you for sharing that. 
Um, we have some great comments in the chat um, from Miss Rita Dove. I love how Dove takes us right there with images, a salute to observation that helps her readers relate to her experience and inspires us to write our experience, our witness of our moments. Thank you, Aram. And we also have a question for y'all um, from Eric Crossley. Please excuse me if I, I'm saying your name incorrectly. As an old white poet who began to wake up being nourished on the wisdom of MLK, I'm worried about the shallowness of many BLM folk who seem to be oblivious to Martin's vision of the relative insignificance of our temporary multicolored, yet dusty and ignorant bodies. How can we simultaneously identify with our skin and our spirits? So I'll reread that um, second portion. I'm worried about the shallowness of many BLM folk who seem to be oblivious to Martin's vision of the relative insignificance of our temporary multicolored yet dusty and ignorant bodies. How can we simultaneously identify with our skin and our spirits? If anybody, oh, Elisa, Elisa. <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> you're ready. <laughs> Um, well, I, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I'm not, um, but I, I think it's a kind of strange uh, dichotomy that's being sketched out there um, and one that I don't think gives Martin Luther King enough credit for uh, his racial analyses or his analyses of race in America. Um, the, uh, I think the idea that skin and spirit are, you know, in some way divisible or that a focus and attention to the materiality of lived experience is in some way limiting is quite a mistake. Um, but I mean, it's, it's an, it's an interesting, um, I think it's an interesting problem to sort of consider how one does respond to um, America. And since we are in this Fulbright conversation, you know, we're also talking like we could broaden that to America and other places, you know, America as colonizer, America as visitor, America as foreigner, um, and to those of us who are like, you know, perhaps foreigners in our own country. Um, but I don't think that there is that tension personally. Thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts? All right. All right, wonderful. Um, let me just see where we are. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, Rita Dove, even though she is not here with us right now. Um, she graciously sent that over and I cannot wait to see the full thing on World Poetry Day. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you. Next on our itinerary for this evening is the Fulbright Alums Poetry Showcase. We will have our outstanding alums and panelists perform some of their original work for us, as well as have a quick Q&A. So please, 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 if you're feeling anything, have any questions, any comments, share them in the chat. Our Fulbright team is, is constantly on the look, all right? And if you like something, snap or clap. <laughs> um, all right, so to begin our showcase, something that's done in the Poetry Slam community is a sacrificial poet. And I am lucky enough to be the sacrificial poet this evening. For those who may not know, in Poetry Slams, a sacrificial poet is a poet who goes first and gets scored by the judges, uh, but is not a part of the competition. They kind of just set the vibe and, and tone for the audience in the room. So in honor of experiencing new things with Miss Frida Dove's lovely floating requiem and everything that has been said thus far, um, and my in honor of my experience in Trinidad and Tobago, my poem is celebrating that and it is entitled San Juan or as the people, the locals would say, San Juan. All right. The air tasted like new country, thunderstorms and Kalalu, the perfect recipe for home. Gravel gargled under car tires as roads spun us into car sickness. To the west, each tree a landmark only a local would know. Mango, guava, chenna, plum, coconut. Foreign is island slang for a person born in or coming from a country other than one's own. Foreign is island slang for a person who looks past natural beauty like it can't do anything for them. To the east, 
children barefoot, laughter boiling until the kettle blew, mommy yelling from up on the hill, come on, eh? Pothound stalking the doubles man until ready to steal a taste of tamarind sauce. Shoo, shoo, let me be now. To the north, mountains as north star, a blanket of green lying across a bed of curves, always leading us home. I looked back squinting, thinking, wondering through the dirt spotted car window. The sun blooms differently here. Brighter, hotter, louder, like this beauty wants me to know it is everything for me. It is home and I am here. Thank you. <laughs> that was actually one of the first pieces I wrote coming off the plane in Trinidad, so it works perfectly. <laughs> um, but first up, we will have um, Alisa Gonzalez to the Fulbright stage. So let's welcome her with all of the emojis in the chat, make it, make it loud and proud. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Lisa. Um, thank you so much. This is it's it's um, your reading was amazing. That was so beautiful. So thank you for sacrificing for us. Um, this is I'm going to read uh, two short poems, one that's slightly longer. Um, and these are um, these first two poems are both set in Poland and were written in Poland when I was there. Um, although I didn't actually write very much about Poland while I was there. Um, but I didn't speak any Polish before I went um, and I um, found the language very challenging. Um, I spent a lot of time studying it. Um, but this first poem is, um, a kind of engagement with that, uh, the lack of abstract thought that one has when one is very new to a language um, and the ways that that affects your life. In Poland, I live in a language sans the letter V and most of the time this feels like no particular loss. When I miss the shape of words like verge and void, I just write live on the back of a bill. It's like looking at a photograph of someone far away whose face pixelates in memory. In my new language, I lack abstract thought and humiliation blooms even when ordering coffee, crochet, or mailing a letter. I rehearse my life before I live it since I must at least pretend to get the words right. I'm sorry, nie mówię Polish, tu zapraszam, I don't speak. Yesterday I said po polsku, I love poetry, and Popolsku, Zbigniew Herbert's widow, said, that's the wrong verb. We don't love poems like we love people. She spoke gently as to a weary, weepy child, just as she had when I said, I can't seem to write. Why? Nie wiem. This morning, outside my window, an oak shields a smoker pacing circles in the snow, a bulldog objecting to a terrier, those sparrows who will almost certainly be dead by spring. Live smears into love, cheap ink, cheap meaning. I salute a magpie, Suprasham, I'm trying to speak. The man across the street tugs his pink curtains closed. I miss his body, he left me a void. I live on the verge of a silence deeper than silence. How can I know the words will come? What does it mean that they always have before? Nie wiem, I don't know, nie wiem. Um, I was there studying the poet Zbigniew Herbert and I did meet his, um, yeah, amazing, wonderful poet. Um, and I met his, uh, his widow who is uh, currently 96, Katarzyna Herbert, um, and she spoke, several languages, but not English. So we conversed in Polish and she often corrected me. Um, but I got to spend a lot of time in his library and um, this poem is called In Zbigniew Herbert's Library, going through his books. In Zbigniew Herbert's library, I must have been in need of fire. What am I saying? I always am, but then especially looking out over Morskie Oko Park when I wasn't scouting marginalia in his books. A travel guide to Greece from 1974 called How to Get There, an architectural study of the Acropolis, Auden's selected poems inscribed by Auden, almost magical, as I'd thought touching the past would be, 
not my past, of course, but his, a poet of restraint, who I thought could teach me how to ponder diagrams of ancient temples without hunting the places where once fierce priestesses sacrificed and slit the throats and burned the meat. Um, this last poem is um, set in Cyprus, which is where I, I moved for a while after I left Poland and I wouldn't have actually ever encountered Cyprus in that way, I think, for it, not for my Fulbright and Poland. So I had that to thank for these two countries that mean a lot to me. Um, and Cyprus is a divided island, in case you don't know. Um, there's a border that runs through it um, and has since 1974. Um, and Nicosia, the capital, is one of the only divided capital cities. It's a strange place to live. <laughs> in a divided city, a tourist asks for directions. If I were that kind of traveler, yes, I could show you the way. Do you want the fence or the door in the fence, the wall or the place where you take photos in front of the wall? The tower where the sentry watches YouTube videos on his phone? Oh, he'll stiffen when he sees you, he'll touch his gun. You'll get the thrill you're after. It's true, on Ermu Street, through barbed wire, you can view the demilitarized, the dead, the buffer zone. Above, a lapwing, a lark. You know, on Ermo Street, I wept on that bench there where a phantom optimist chalked, your wall will not divide us. While someone I love, he ran down Odysseo Street. No, he wasn't fleeing, he was searching. He has searched a long time on the other side of the wall, on Marmara Street, on Arasta. How far? Are you asking the distance from home or from where we happen to be? if I weren't so tired of turning the map upside down. You are not the one who understands and I am the one who understands less. I have been here a little longer. In February, almond trees pitched with white blossoms so full of bees, groves whirred like helicopter blades. March, April, the Sahara blew in. When dust disappeared the mountains, I forgot them like a stupid dog. Thunderstorms at last in May. I crushed rain in the folds of this very dress. High summer chased us to the shore at Aligadi, where turtles rested eggs at night, where the day tucked us into blue, the sea cucumber skirts of clouds. Yes, if you reach the crossing, you'll get what you want. You have a good passport from a good country. After you are not denied exit, before you are not denied entry, for 30 meters, you're not in a country at all. You should pay some attention. So I heard a sunburned Glaswegian admonish her daughter who dwelled in a state of sullenness. I don't want to be anywhere, the daughter mumbled. What was he searching for? Well, there's a hole. No, not what you're hoping. Neither bullet hole nor pocked wall. The wall is a wall and a word, the whole is not. Some name it a function of language. If it exists, if it's found, if it fills the mouth, and if someone has the kind of mouth to use it, anyone could say, the border is not anywhere, the border is not. No, listen, I mean everyone would. Your mouth and mine would be so full of nothing before we loose whatever good animal we don't know abides within us. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. If you cannot hear the claps, imagine it. <laughs> I think you have competition well for the fan club. <laughs> but this is beautiful um so many so many compliments gorgeous great um i crushed rain in the folds of the very dress just wow um your language and choice of words is so so intentional and poignant it's and then the way you read you literally make i think i saw will at one point closing his eyes and just rocking back <laughs> beautifully read amazing um and some other comments i love how you wove the polish into your poem and contextualized it so we can understand that is it it is a tricky needle to thread in from your first piece as well as from your first piece 
Natalie says, so perfectly described the frustration of not being able to express yourself. Um, even that line about love, ugh, I mean, just heartbreaking. <laughs> um, but I, I would love to ask the question to you um, because you described a little bit about your Fulbright experience in previous uh, questions that I posed during Rita Dove's pieces, but how has your Fulbright experience and even just learning the language um, informed your current work or even kind of more broadly, just your creative process, just being able to create? A great question. I'm sure as I've, everyone else has also had formative um, changes during their time. So I'm curious to hear about that. But um, I mean, I think there were, the Fulbright was the first time that I, I mean, just practically speaking was taken seriously as a researcher and an artist in a way where I was given freedom to um, outside of a school context, um, go pursue interests, go make work with the I mean, it was deep and profound freedom, which was at first terrifying. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, um, but I do think I learned to write for myself there, um, you know, during that time. But I also think, um, you know, I did fall in love with places. I learned what it was to be a traveler and I learned what it was to be a stranger in a different way um, in language and among people. Um, and I, I, I think that I am still um, oriented toward that. So I do write um, both in poetry and prose about places that I have been, but I think I'm, I'm really, the thing that I see most deeply in my work is an interest in that experience of estrangement or distance or interpretation or misinterpretation or mangling of languages or um, ideas and, the process of trying to make sense of things, of the things that you're seeing, the things that you don't understand. Um, there's also an attunement, I think, that happens that you can bring to life in a more familiar place, you know, or, you know, life at home, life where you grew up, like Will said, start at the, you know, backward at the beginning or whatever. Um, but an attunement to the dissonances and to um, the complexities that, that, that has definitely stayed with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, for choosing those works to share with us tonight, because that was perfectly woven into what we've been discussing this evening. And, and that was just your organic, natural choosing. <laughs> you just wanted to talk about that tonight. So thank you. Um, all right, we're going to go on to our second poet, Ruth Bihar. And Ruth will be sharing her work in both Spanish and English. So definitely um, look at the captioning um, and let's give a round of applause for Ruth. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Elisa, you were amazing. And you too, Aliyah. It's really, really amazing to be in your company. And I can't wait to hear Will as well. So thank you so much. So as you heard already, as a Fulbright student to Spain, um, I had the privilege of going to live in a small village in the north in León. And that's how I began my journey um, as a cultural anthropologist and as a poet. And being a Cuban immigrant girl, I grew up speaking Spanish and I really loved the Spanish language from the time I was very young. And in Spain, you might say I returned to my mother tongue, um, but I also reclaimed another heritage, that of my father. Um, our paternal line descends from Sephardic Jews who were expelled from Spain in 1492, but continued speaking Spanish wherever they went. So Spanish comes to me from that history, as well as from my Cuban heritage. And it's a complex history because of the difficult relationship I have with my father. And all of that finds its way into the first poem I want to share. Um, this one I will read just in, in English to give us enough time. It's called Nameless Daughter for Papi. <clears throat> when I became a woman, I felt strange hugging and kissing my father. As punishment, he stopped calling me by my name. For years now, he's addressed me in the third person as someone else's child. I'm Eya, she. 
Tu hija, your daughter, la niña, the girl, or lately, la profesora. In retaliation, I stopped calling him papi. He became father, padre, pa. He became the two letters of my baby talk, a notch above silence. But my father doesn't know, I know, he cries, that we both cry in the night listening to Sephardic love songs. I that Spanish of courtyards ripe with pomegranates. I that Spanish of those told to go and never turn back. Why should this poem ask for tender mercy? It's in his blood to not forgive. To not forgive the daughter who left and couldn't say goodbye. I that Spanish cursed with pride that sticks to the tongue. I that Spanish of the father and the daughter listening listening to Sephardic love songs and crying in the night. So I was fortunate to also be a Fulbright scholar to Argentina. By then, 26 years after the first Fulbright, I was a professor teaching anthropological theory and method to a very brilliant group of students at the University of Buenos Aires. So my academic Spanish improved tremendously during that time and mind and body needed to be in balance. And I found myself entranced by the tango, the heart of which lives in the great city of Buenos Aires. So by day, I was a professor. By night, I was a tango dancer, finding a magical world in the milongas, the dance parties. So naturally, I wrote a poem about the tango called Memory of a Man's Handkerchief. When you go to Buenos Aires to dance the tango, I advise you, if you are a woman who appreciates sadness, not to miss the milonga at the Viejo Correo. I almost lost out on that experience. They had warned me not to go there. That milonga was like a home for the aged, all of them clumsy, hardly able to move. But I, stubborn as always, went anyway. An elegant man invited me to dance. He could have been my grandfather. He carried a handkerchief in his jacket pocket. On the dance floor, he suddenly removed his handkerchief. He opened it like the wings of a butterfly. He placed the handkerchief on the palm of his hand. Before taking his first step, he told me, so I won't leave my sweat on your hand, senorita. I looked at him without comprehending. It's a custom from the earliest days of the tango, he explained. You don't see it anywhere these days. I had the fortune of being there for that gentlemanly gesture. I put my palm on the handkerchief. The man closed his hand lightly. We danced a tanda, four songs to make you cry. I felt like a seashell being cupped to his ear. He could hear the cries of the seagulls within me. He could taste the salt of all my disappointments. He could see the blue eternity of the ocean I fear and love so much. I surrendered to him, to the tango, to the beautiful voyage. But the moment of the curtain had to arrive and the tanda ended. I released my hand. He removed his handkerchief and again placed it in his pocket. We said goodbye with all the affection of the world. He had nothing more to give me than the memory of that handkerchief. Inside that little piece of cloth, he stole away a bit of my youth. So now to close, I'm going to read two poems from my bilingual poetry book, Everything I Kept, Todo lo que guardé, which was published by Swan Isle Press. And in recent years, I've been able to travel to Cuba, the island where I was born. And I have a poem that's a letter to a friend there. It's called Letter. And I'll read it in English first and then in Spanish, Carta. Letter. My dear friend, I have the autumn leaves, you have the blue ocean. I have the wide and terrifying highways of the world, you have the crumbling streets of our island. I have the fear of a lamb in a den of wolves, 
You have the courage of a samurai warrior. I have silver and steel. I have a house too big for me and a calendar marking the days when I will be away. I have tomorrow and tomorrow. I have everything. You have the witness of your eyes. Carta. Mi querida amiga, yo tengo las hojas del otoño. Tú tienes el azul del mar. Yo tengo las carreteras anchas y espantosas del mundo. Tú tienes las calles derrumbadas de nuestra isla. Yo tengo el miedo de un cordero en una madriguera de lobos. Tú tienes el valor de un guerrero, samurai. Yo tengo la plata y el acero. Tengo una casa demasiado grande para mí y un calendario donde están marcados los días que no estaré. Tengo mañana y mañana, lo tengo todo. Tú tienes la mirada de tus ojos. And now, to finish, just tell you that I love the ocean, but I'm also afraid of it, afraid of its immensity. Maybe this is true of many of us who have crossed waters. Um, my search for an understanding of the vast diversity of Spanish culture and language has also been a search for home and the courage to be free. So I'm going to end with a poem that speaks to that quest. It's called Freedom or Libertad in Spanish. And I'll start with the Spanish this time, Libertad. Al fin fui al mar hoy, yo sola. ¿Por qué esperé tanto tiempo? Tanta belleza podía haber sido mía hace días y días. Pero al menos fui. Me senté en la arena y abrí las palmas. Esperé. Me olvidé que había sentido miedo. Después dejé de esperar. Y sentí la libertad. Vasta, inmensa, incognoscible, embelezadora, divina. Freedom. At last, I went to the ocean today, all alone. Why did I wait so long? Such beauty could have been mine days and days ago. But at least I went. I sat in the sand and opened my palms. I waited. I forgot I had been afraid. Soon I stopped waiting and felt freedom. Vast, huge, unknowable, ravishing, divine. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Um, wow. <laughs> and I know so many people have said, wow, so I'm actually quoting someone. <laughs> but Vicky liked the phrase, he opened like the wings of a butterfly. Linda says, beautiful. Tushar says, wow. Um, I could experience the events with each word. Um, dancing inside that little handkerchief, he stole away a bit of my youth. Beautiful. Um, and Sandra can't decide which is prettier, English or Spanish. She loves them both. And I think that is a great segue. Um, Sandra, I don't think we have to choose. <laughs> I don't think we have to. Um, and it makes me think, I, I met a poet once um, who's, who is bi who's bilingual. And when I asked them why they choose every day to incorporate their native language, their native tongue in their writing, they replied with, I must. How can I not come up? and show up as my full self, I, I must. And it was as simple as that. Um, and I'm curious of what are your reasons? Um, because sonically, I mean, just it's, it's a beautiful sound in general, um, because now you know people want to tangle with you from your poetry, <laughs> just the musicality of the language. But what are your reasons to incorporate both pieces of your identities? Yeah, I think they are just truly a part of me and it's it's really hard to separate them. Um, you know, I grew up as a bilingual child. Um, like many immigrant children, I was always translating for my parents. I learned English before they did. And so I was always in my mind thinking, how do I say that in Spanish or how do I say that in English? So, so I had that translation sensibility. 
and having the good fortune to have lived in Spain um, for a long time and then also in Mexico. My husband actually had a Fulbright to Mexico, so I, I got to experience uh, Mexico as well. And then later on going to Argentina and, and eventually to Cuba and experiencing you know the place where I was born. Um, I think being in contact with all of these countries where Spanish is spoken and, and hearing the diversity of it because how Spaniards speak Spanish is so different from how it's spoken in Argentina, for example, or in Cuba. And so that vast diversity of this language, it just made me love it more. And it made me, I think, have to think about, well, which Spanish is mine, <laughs> since there's so many different ways to speak Spanish. And, um, and it was actually friends of mine in Cuba who said that I should be writing in Spanish since that was my first language. Um, but I came to the United States, you know, when I was five and a half. So all my schooling has been in English, um, but I spoke Spanish at home. And so it just seemed very natural to me. And um, with these two last poems that I read, um, when I write, sometimes I start in Spanish and then I move to English. And in some, I start in English and then I move to Spanish. Or I actually go back and forth. I'll go, oh, I really like this particular word in Spanish. And for example, there's this word that I love in Spanish. I, I don't think it appears in any of the poems I read, um, but it's it's when roses become wilted. There's this phrase marchitar, se marchitaron las rosas. And that word marchitar, there's just no way to translate it exactly. I love it. Um, and so you can say the rose is wilted, but it sounds very different in, in English. So. Um, so I think for me, it's just the joy of knowing both languages and being able to move between them. And sometimes I'm not really translating, but I'm recreating the poem in one language um, or the other. And I just think of it as, as you know, I have a mother tongue and a father tongue in a sense. Um, and so, um, so I really can't divide divide myself from them. They're they're both a part of me and um, and I just love the idea also of promoting bilingualism a little bit more and putting a book out there that's in both languages is just kind of affirming that you can be more than one identity um, also so I think just affirming that complexity that, that we all have. Absolutely, absolutely. We actually have a question from uh, Sarah. Do you feel one language or other first fits better for certain poems or certain emotions or topics. We kind of touched on that a little bit, but we'd love to hear more. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, Spanish is the language of the heart to me. It's the language of emotions. You know, it's also the language in which my parents got angry in Spanish. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's got some elements that are not so positive, but um, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, it's the language of emotion and emotion is a, is a spectrum of many of many different feelings. So um, so I respect that. And um, and yeah, you know, I, I, I've read a lot of poetry in Spanish. I think when I just discovered the Cuban poet Jose Martí, who also spent many years in Spain and, and then many years as an exile in New York. Um, I think his poetry just was a, like a connection to so many different things. And he has a line from his um, his um, simple verses, the versos sencillos, where he says something like, yo vengo de todas partes y hacia todas partes voy. I come from all places and I go to all places. And, and I just love that. I love that idea of, of that fluidity. Um, so so I, I want to kind of bring that into my work, that fluidity of, even though he was very, very Cuban and very, patriot, very patriotic and led a whole, you know, independence struggle um, against, against the Spaniards, in fact, at the end of the 19th century and died fighting for Cuba's freedom. But at the same time, he could imagine himself being kind of a citizen of the world. And, and I think I love that. And um, so, so having the two languages makes me feel like I'm, I'm a citizen of more than, more than one place. And, um, and I love that. So yeah, so I think Spanish will always have that kind of emotional power for me, but I also love English so much um, and love poetry um, in English and, and um, you know, so, so performance and so on in English. I, I love that language too. And I am grateful in that sense to my parents for having made the decision to immigrate, which made me be a child of two languages and two cultures. Thank you, thank you. Everyone's snapping, so. <laughs> um, as artists and Fulbright alums, we fall in love with places and people. <laughs> so I love that. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. All right.
And lastly, we have to the Fulbright stage, the Will Langford. Come on, give us the emojis. Keep the energy coming, y'all. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here uh, with you all today. Um, I'm especially grateful um, to all of you for being here uh, and also to my friends in Spartan Nation and uh, Detroit, Michigan, and all over the world. Uh, it really takes a village, and it's great to see the village here uh, in this Zoom session. So I have a few poems um, prepared for you all today. Um, I won't say too much about them, um, but for this first one, uh, I'll say a bit. Um, my experiences um, as a Fulbright scholar gave me the chance to see the world uh, my experiences as a university student, both at Michigan State and Penn State, uh, really helped to give me uh, a platform to celebrate um, literacy and to tell my story. Uh, this first poem uh, is called Schooled, and uh, it is for everyone uh, who wonders if that big dream is something that they can do. Schooled. One minute, I was a poet at Detroit's Cast Tech High. The next, a reality check, I was a Spartan, marching among the thousands. I bet you felt it. On a Tuesday, between organic chemistry and lunch at the Union, it hits you. You're from another time zone, and you're the only one like you. Tucked in the palm of the mitten, you can't see yourself fitting in here. Frigid winter whiteouts, go green, go white shoutouts. You've got your campus map out. The midnight scream during exams week, all this at the expense of your beauty sleep. Back home, maybe they roll tide or the Friday night lights shine on games of cricket. Maybe there's a sea breeze and a salt smell and not these salted sidewalks chalked and graffiti stenciled. You penciled in a chat with your mother, which begat the feeling that you're out of your depth, which begat something nasty deep in your chest. You can expel it. You are different. You are wanted here. We're choking on the dust of indifference, but spitting back our insistence that coexistence is not enough. These chains, nagging links, are begging to be broken by the sun, rising on the day when I'm not taken to be a token except for the fact that I do stand for change. It's rolling along the banks of this red cedar, and I see it there, in you, sprinting headlong on the track, waist deep in a lecture, waist deep in conjecture that expects that we'll connect with respect for the reality that we are vastly different like magma and mercury rising to the occasion to celebrate what makes us if only in a smile say you are welcome here poet preacher teacher reacher out salsa dancer freelancer le gourmet cooks deep in your books it's all here under this sun this sun yearns for it because a dream lives here in our sparks and our kindling and we have only to let it burn. Thank you. So um, that poem uh, is, is part of the Spartans Will series of pieces uh, that I've been so, so happy to share with lots and lots of college students. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to all of you uh, for the positive energy you're giving me for this piece. Um, and I also hope that you'll share it with people who are headed to college or thinking about a Fulbright or thinking about going abroad, all of that, all of that. Uh, I'll share two more. I had planned to share just one more poem, but I'll share two more. This one is called Avatars. It responds to the digitization uh, that we're watching happening rapidly in our age. Um, this poem uh, is featured in my forthcoming collection, uh, Detroit Workers, Teachers, Lovers. Here we go. Avatars. We've made it. The future weighed us and found us packing. Love for our earth, its oceans, its asylum seekers, its meek, 
and it's many, many weary. Found us making music in the waking hours of tragedy, forging art in back alleys, making amends for amendments late to the docket. Congratulations. We're notorious for missing the forest for the trees. It is now your mission to ensure that we don't miss the road for the digital milestones, miss the movement for the buckshot of tweets, scattering matter when what matters is a smattering of facts, scattered roughshod over 140 characters. It verges on haiku, the art of saying so much and so little, so briefly. It is your sacred duty to ensure that we never forget the moment when smartphones took the place of lighters at concerts where the bass was especially heavy. To make sure our next generation of iterations remembers the time when the word of mouth was the word and the word was good. I read that the volume of data on Wikipedia alone cannot be housed by any library of sensible size. A veritable Alexandria stretches before our fingertips and yawns at our inability to contain it. I implore you to contain it, to write the word or speak it, to not wait on change, but to be it, to be more than avatar. Thank you. Uh, some of the themes there are um, really things that I began to experience during my time in Kenya. Uh, Snapchat got big, TikTok probably got big, and I missed all of those waves. I think a lot about what it means to connect, whether technology is bringing us closer or further apart. So Avatars is a poem that just speaks to it and calls on us to continue to connect uh, in, in, in human, personal, emotional ways. Lastly, um, yeah, to not wait on change, but to be it. Lastly, um, I'll, I'll close uh, with one of my favorite poems. It's called Shop Around. Uh, when I was a boy, it was the first song I danced to uh, as a tap dancer. Later, it was the poem that I used uh, to win the title of Motown Mike Spoken Word Artist of the Year. It's a meditation on the Detroit uh, from TV and newspapers and the Detroit that I call my home. I'm that stubborn kind of fellow. When I'm alone, I cry, I heard it through the grapevine. What's going on? Trouble, man. Mary Wells is shopping around for that Motown sound. And so do we marvel at the news on our doorsteps that Detroit is on the rise. Some Ford Falcon on cinder blocks climbing through the ashes of the ghetto a rose gold recollection of our greatest hits. The saints and the sinners would have you believe our hope died in the riots. The contours of our Bing steel body misaligned by the fires and the blight. The temptations to say Detroit sees new light in the queue line and suburban flight directly into our core. But you cannot remix and you cannot remaster Cast Corridor with Erasure. This rare earth cannot be so easily purchased, signed, sealed, delivered, and FedEx to your doorstep. They forget we've got that soul clap in our bones. We've got that church on every block, Jesus. So please, Mr. Postman, deliver them some truth. Tell them about Black Bottom. Tell them how we bounce back from devastation like dandelions, gnarled and still shining. Joe Lewis on the ropes, gliding through shots to the body. This is the Motown sound, a supreme three-part Copacabana cornucopia to uncloud your cornea. And God is writing this album from the top down 
We're living for the city. We're headed for higher ground. I've watched Detroit, thought drowned, thought defunct, rise like the Earl of Funk. Through our eyes, we see miracles every day. Detroiters hustling harder from the check and go on Joseph Campo to the wonder of a young Stevie sound checking at the Apollo from bowls of beans to beans bowls fingertips building an empire on the boulevard so my lady can go dancing in the streets can click her heels three times in a warehouse brimming with enough mortar to brick back the barber shops every black business cropped and bathe in the cool of hues. Walk down Woodward toward our dream, undeferred, undeterred. My lady no longer sings the blues and is as fond as ever of your mahogany. Detroit is the sound of young America, hungry and full and hungry and full of music. The push and pull of our penance like tides and like tides cast across the plate. Listen, if you would but lend your ear to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the emojis are going. <laughs> Dope. Um, just amazing, amazing. And, and I want to correct my term. I think it's nice to have a fan club, but I think we need to highlight that you're making a difference in people's lives, that people are calling you professor. You're, you're changing them every day. <laughs> and I think you're doing it through this combination of theater, spoken word, and this appreciation for musicality, which Rita Dove brought from the very beginning, right? Um, and I noticed that she was a violinist and you're a tap dancer. So Elisa and Ruth, put it in the chat. What, what's your secret talent? <laughs> but as we continue on, um, we highlighted earlier that the Fulbright program is dedicated to engaging communities globally and locally. And as a part of this evening of poetry, we are adamant and even our, our Fulbright alums were adamant about connecting to that community and including that community. And we had a number of brilliant submissions. And tonight we are excited to hear from three of those audience members. Um, and so first I will bring to the stage, Muriel Harris. She is a Fulbright US scholar alumna to Ghana. She will be reading her poem, The Hurricane. Please join me in welcoming Muriel. Thank you, thank you very much. This has been an amazing evening. Thank you, Lisa, thank you, Ruth, thank you, Will, and thank you, Aaliyah. I just loved all your poems. I don't, I don't know how I follow any of this, but um, I'm gonna try <laughs> with my little poem. <laughs> okay, it's, um, it's called The Hurricane. And I wrote it after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Many of you will remember, all of you might remember, um, we lost 1,833 individuals. It's a category five hurricane in New, Ze um, New Orleans. The hurricane. To most people in this far off plain, it was really just another hurricane. No reason to move both house and home. No reason for a people to roam. It was not just a night of rain, that August night of the hurricane, that in the end caused so much pain to a land much loved with so much fame. The aftermath of the hurricane was one that resulted in much blame and people left to bear the shame abandoned in their time of pain. The levees held on, but was all in vain. Death and destruction were all around the plain. And public health became a household name for a place in the South with an unforgettable pain. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Alisa. Do you have any encouraging words, thoughts, comments on this beautiful piece? Um, yeah, I'm so glad that I get to comment on it. Muriel, thank you so much for reading that. Um, I was really 
struck by um, your, I think, really apt use of rhyme that to really drive home, I think, the force of what you were talking about and to emphasize that word again and again. Um, like there's a really wonderful like cognitive movement in the poem, like you're saying something, but there's simultaneously this like, you know, this profound rhythmic movement as well. So thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you, Muriel. And thank you for having the courage and bravery to come forward and share your piece. That was, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Appreciate it. Yes. Second, we would like to welcome Nan Jackson. She joins us from the Lansing Poetry Club as a part of the community. Nan will be sharing her poem, Online Learn Learning, and we will have Ruth give some very encouraging words and thoughts after she's done. Thank you, and let's welcome Nan. Thank you so much, Aliyah, and all the poets and the audience members. Uh, poetry has been an important part of my life ever since childhood, and it's often found its way into my teaching as a community college math professor. One of my favorite poems to share with my students has been Rita Dove's poem, Geometry. Uh, some of what I value about mathematics is very different from the impressions that my students bring, and teaching through a poem like Rita Doves is sometimes the best way to expand their ideas about the subject and how they might interact with it. Although I'm not a Fulbright alum, I do have a family connection through my sister, Maureen Jackson. She received a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship for International Dissertation Research in 2005. During her Fulbright year doing research in the Turkish Jewish community in Istanbul, I was able to visit her, which was an amazing experience. Her Fulbright research was the foundation for her PhD dissertation and also led to the publication of her book, Mixing Musics. The poem I'm reading tonight was inspired by a New York Times article on the challenges facing students in Indonesia who are studying online during the pandemic. It's for all students, including so many in the United States, who don't always have reliable internet access. Online learning. Each morning she sets out from home, walks a mile along the mountain path, stops at a spot where she hopes for a strong signal. Branch by branch, she climbs the tallest tree, finds a perch in its upper reaches, opens her cell phone. Aligned with the universe, she checks for instructions from her teachers, begins her lessons. She is learning to keep her balance, her back against the strong wood, her mind playing in rhythms of poetry and rhymes of geometric proof. For precious moments while the signal's strong, she loses herself in thought and then climbs down. Thank you. Beautiful images. Ruth, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Nan. That is just such a beautiful poem. I loved every single word and how you put it together. Um, I think this is a poem that really teaches us empathy. And I think that's one of the things that we want to do with poetry is open our hearts to others and understand the positions of other people. And I think just I just imagine this young person struggling to to gain Internet access and going this extra mile, literally, mm -hmm. um, and climbing a tree to be able to do so that just completely opens my heart. And I think, you know, we, we talk about the lack of, of equity and the lack of access and we can talk about that abstractly, but it's quite different to really be able to live it with one person and what this one person does to be able to access and to be able to, um, to, you know, to continue her schooling and her learning. So it's just so, so beautiful. And it's just um, written um, with, with just such gorgeous attention um, to every, every single word. And you just, you just want to cheer for this person. And I think you've just done such a beautiful job. And, and I love the online learning as the title is somewhat ironic title, but you know, that, um, that we're not all, you know, equally graced with internet access in our homes that, uh, you know, some of us have to 
to work harder and struggle more. Um, but 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 we will. But those that have to do so, like this one person, uh, will. And um, and you just want to again cheer and just feel the, the courage and the beauty and uh, of that this person brings to to the desire desire to keep learning. Thank you so much, Ruth. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to the both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And last, but never least, as I always say, third, we have Humna Navid. She's a current Fulbright foreign student from Pakistan, sharing her piece, Women of Color. And we will have Will give encouraging thoughts and words on that piece. Um, that's brilliant. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful event. Um, so tonight I will be reading my poem, Women of Color. So coming from South Asia, which was a colonized country in the past, uh, the South Asian women have always had a distinguishable, distinguishable skin tone, somewhat lying within the spectrum of all the skin shades. Through my poem, I wanted to highlight these differences playfully, crafted in cultural connotations, but united by the hues of femininity. So here it goes. We are women of color, brown like the earth, gold like our hearts, made of a palette of power, of wisdom, of abuse, of desire, of silence and laughter, tainted like a rose windows in hues of love and emotion. We are the women of color. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Will. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. I especially uh, appreciate on the, the way that you used uh, images from the earth that conjure um, strength and that conjure power. I love that the poem uh, never resolves uh, upon struggle, but instead upon beauty and upon strength and upon the diversity of women. Uh, I love that it takes on, as you say, like a, a humorous angle, right? Because uh, it, it characterizes, I think something that goes forgotten is that justice requires joy. Justice requires happiness. Justice requires that we get to live in these moments where we're celebrated and beautiful and happy, right? Where we are like living out right, the things that like we'd like to see in our lives. And so I love that your poem uh, balances a celebration of both that struggle, but also like what makes life so rich. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it with us, Hamna. Thank you so much. Really, I, it's been an honor. And I'm, I'm glad that um, I've had the opportunity today to share with such amazing and brilliant poets that I had never known if I wouldn't have been a part of this event. Um, so really, thank you for everyone to organize for organizing this and you know giving us the time to really say some um, thoughts here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, this is what this event was about: was connecting each other and just remembering that we are here for one another, especially in a time where we have not been literally physically here for one another in over a year. So I, I, I've been so thankful to, to help work on this event. So thank you for those words from our panelists. Thank you to our three audience performers and to everyone, never stop writing. At this point in our tenor, I'm gonna pass it back to Kara um, to share some words with you. Thank you so much, Aliyah. Uh, amazing job hosting and amazing readings from our poets, Rita Dove, Elisa, Ruth, Will, Muriel, Nan, Humna. Thank you all um, to our audience members for attending this evening's event. It was such a pleasure to spend the evening with all of you. Um, so many creative and compassionate minds here. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on future 75th anniversary events, we encourage you to visit our Fulbright 75th anniversary website and sign up for the newsletter so that you can get notified about any upcoming events we have. Here you can also view the extended version of Rita Dove's World Poetry Day message that will link out um, in the chat now. And just a huge, Thank you from all of us for attending. And with that, I would like to turn it back over to Aliyah to close out our time together. 
All right, folks. You know, the definition of poetry has never been more wide open. It remains a significant art form that profoundly reflects what makes us human. We find that there's a deep hunger for poetry for expression right now. Um, and tonight's evening of poetry was all about encouraging people to think and share, to learn diverse perspectives and to grow in, in appreciation of poetry. So thank you all for attending to tonight's event. Um, to close, we would like to end with a quote from our featured poet, Ms. Rita Dove. Without imagination, we can go nowhere. And imagination is not restricted to the arts. Every scientist I have met who has been a success has had to imagine. Rita Dove. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay creative, and never stop imagining. Until next time, bye Fulbright family. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>